Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to B-Side Las Vegas Ground Truth. This talk, Security Data Science Teams, a guide to prestige classes, given by Eric. Eric is a hacker and computer scientist working as principal researcher in, in Rapid 7's office of the CTO. Presently, Eric leads R&D supporting Rapid 7's managed detection and response service. An alumnus of John Hopkins University, he has published a number of academic papers and given talks on security decision theory and artificial intelligence applications for security at conferences from AAAI and GameSec to DEF CON's AI Village. He has spent his entire life in different parts of information security ranging from threat intelligence and malware analysis to cloud security and security architecture. Before we begin, I have a few announcements to make. We would like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsors, Adobe, and our gold sponsors, Prisma Cloud, SEMGREP, BlueCat, PlexTrack, Toyota, and Conductor One. It's their support along with our sp other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this event possible. We have few policies that we want everybody to be paying attention. These talks are being streamed live, except in on the ground, and as a courtesy to our speakers and audience, we ask that you check your phone and make sure it is in silent mode. We also have few photo policies here so the B-side Las Vegas photo policies prohibits taking pictures without the explicit permission of everyone in the frame. So if you want to have a picture or a photo, make sure you have explicit permission of that person in the frame. That being said, we would like to welcome Mr. Eric on the stage. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. It is a pleasure for all of you to be here. I am surprised at how many people turned out, given that there was a you know, nice little break between the two talks. So thank you all for being here. Um, I wouldn't be excited to speak to an empty room, but I am excited to speak to a room that has at least seven or eight people in it. So with that, uh, my name is Erica Lincoln. Uh, you know, as, as was mentioned, I lead AI research at Rapid7. And I'm going to talk a little bit about security data science teams uh, and kind of what that means. So just to begin, what is security data science, right? Which I think the, the clear definition is the study of security data to extract meaningful insights. And if you disagree, that's fine. I have a microphone and you don't. So a little bit of, about what security data means, right? Because that, that feels like it can mean a lot of things. So, you know, this usually means the analysis of things like logs, whether that's system, firewall, load balancer logs. I have spent so much time on load balancer logs. God, please, I don't ever want to look at load balancer logs again. Uh, files, right? So this can be executables, documents, scripts, uh, read malware, uh, or, you know, other artifacts, right? So packet captures, which don't quite fall into logs or files, right? Uh, but, you know, I'm sure that some of you are coming up with things I haven't mentioned yet. And, you know, there, there are lots of things. Use your imagination, right? If it relates to security and you can extract data from it, you can probably do security data science on it. So security data science is, of course, done by security data scientists. What does it mean to be a security data scientist? Well, it means that you're someone who does security data science. You're welcome. Uh, most security data scientists come from two backgrounds, right? That's either data scientists who are interested in security. So typically this is somebody who started a PhD in physics and decided they wanted to make actual money uh, or security analysts who are interested in data, which are, you know, that, that's my background. So I, I have a little bit of a bias here and I acknowledge that up front. Now, when we think about security data scientists and especially these data scientists who are interested in security, one of the points that I like to make to aspiring to young uh, new hire security data scientists is that it's kind of a prestige class, right? And so for those of you who somehow are not nerds but are listening to this talk, prestige classes are a concept from role-playing games, right? 
And that is to say, there are prerequisites to reaching a prestige class. So if you want to be, right, you want a prestige class, you want to acquire it, you have to be a certain level, you have to have certain attributes, you have to have certain traits, you have to be an existing class, and then you kind of prestige into the prestige class, right? There's a certain level cap before you can get to your prestige class. It's not, it's not an entry level thing. And uh, when I say that, I get a lot of reactions where they're like, is this gatekeeping? And yeah, sorry, yes, it is, right? And I think that I have a, a fun anecdote that, that will help you understand. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, a malware classifier that was built by data scientists. So they started with this big corpus of malware, um, literally millions and millions of malware samples. And they did all their analysis and picked it apart and you know, identified the features and how they were gonna featureize it and how they were gonna build the classifier. And then they trained a whole classifier on this. Um, and, and this is a true story from a, a former employer. So how did it do? Well, it got uh, above 90% accuracy on the test set. It did incredibly well. Uh, excellent F1 score, excellent AUC. If I remember correctly, it was like a 0.96 AUC. For those of you who don't know what AUC is, that's the area under the curve. One is like literally perfect. The AUC basically measures the trade-off between false positives and false negatives, right? Um, the higher it is, the better. So that's incredible. That's it, it, unreal classifier. And so what were the two most important features for the classifier? Uh, Number one most important feature for determining whether or not an executable was malware was the system language. Uh, number two was the compiler. For those of you who have ever thought about malware a moment in your life, you may realize that these are not features that are particularly important in determining whether or not an executable is malicious. So these data scientists went off on their own, built a classifier and said, here you go, it's awesome, it's so good. And we were like, hell yeah. What, what does it do? Explain it to us. And uh, they were like, yeah, it just checks the system language. If it's Chinese or Russian, it's pretty much always malicious. If it was compiled with Borland Delphi, it's pretty much always malicious. And it's like, nope, absolutely, no, ab wrong. <laughs> wrong, right? Which is to say, security data science requires security skill and data skill. Right? And if you're a low level character, that is, you've just graduated college, you know, um, you may not have the right balance of skills to be a good security data scientist to start, right? That's not to say that you can't get there. Um, and of course, you can get there, right? As you start off in your data science journey and your security journey, and you aspire to become a security data scientist, you'll acquire more experience, you'll acquire ability points, and you can put those ability points in different parts of your skill tree, right? So in role-playing games, skill trees are a way that as you build up your levels, you will unlock new skills. Some skills are prerequisites to other skills. Sometimes you need to have both skills in the line to get to that third skill. You need to you know, have your spheres or your ability points, whatever analogy makes sense for you. But it's tough to move directly to, say, assessing the security of large language models if you've never trained a logistic regression classifier. You need to grasp what's happening under the hood before you can really get to the point where you're making well-reasoned, valid assertions about what is happening where, right? And there's a lot of skills that can go into being a security data scientist. I've put a bunch up here, I'm not gonna read them, but one of the things is, you know, especially if you're thinking about security data, it's tough for people to reason about, well, I built something that tells me whether or not a, a, an HTTP stream contains malicious network traffic. If you've never analyzed malicious network traffic, right? You can build that classifier, but when you get a false positive, when you get a false negative, it's going to be really difficult for you to understand why that happened, explain it, and fix it. Uh, a lot of times, data scientists, data people in general, they get stuck on this notion that, well, all we need is more data. 
We just get more data and then we train it some more and then it works. And that's not always the case because you have these weird, ambiguous corner cases, especially in network traffic, which is a nightmare to do analysis on. You see things like um, we were training a classifier for anomalous data transfer. And one fun thing is that printers sometimes get a lot of data. You send a lot of data to a printer. Some printers, depending on the make and the model and the protocol, don't actually receive that much data. So does it look like XFIL or does it not look like XFIL? Well, I guess that depends on whether it's a Lexmark or a Xerox. And of course, if you don't know how to look at that PCAP and say, oh, okay, yeah, this is weird. It's using this printer you know, protocol that wasn't in our training set. You're not going to get that. Uh, it can be really tough, right? And so as we're looking at the skills and thinking about the different skills, whether that's you know, good old fashioned AI, deep learning, data visualization, containerization and deployment, ML ops, et cetera, that brings us into job titles. And job titles are something that drive me uniquely insane um, because, well, we'll get into it, right? But some, some common titles, you see machine learning engineer, data scientist, data engineer, data analyst, ML ops, engineer, uh, et cetera, right? And so you can kind of break up the responsibilities of the role. Uh, the, I'm not, I don't need to read this list to you. Uh, you don't have to read it. You can take a picture of it, it's fine. Uh, or a screen capture if you're watching remotely, what's up? Uh, but essentially, you know, there is some overlap in the roles. There are some, you know, really defined things, right? Uh, ML ops is almost completely disjoint from a data scientist. There's overlap between an ML engineer and ML ops, overlap between the ML engineer and the data scientist. My job title is AI researcher. And um, that's not on here because it is silly. <laughs> so the problem is that this is my idealized version because most orgs end up structured like this, where everybody has the job title data scientist and we don't distinguish. Um, we don't distinguish at all between whether you are doing the deployment, whether you're doing the maintenance, whether you are just doing data visualization, you work with data, you science the data, and therefore you are a data scientist. Uh, and so my hot take is like, maybe we should just stop using that title. No more data scientists. Uh, I think that by putting that restriction on ourselves, we kind of force ourselves to think about how those titles might matter and how we can delineate those roles and responsibilities. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. But when we're thinking about the roles and responsibilities of security data organizations, right? That's presenting security findings to leadership in digestible ways. That usually means uh, hopefully something other than a pie chart, but sometimes they really want a pie chart, even though it doesn't actually tell you anything meaningful, please stop using pie charts, uh, right? Presenting security data in stakeholder relevant ways. So this can be if your stakeholder is like a SOC analyst, well, a chart is not going to be nearly as helpful to a SOC analyst as something they can read and take action on. A lot of times all a SOC analyst wants is red or green. Is it bad or do I not care about it, right? And that really matters. How you present those findings does matter. Uh, and it's where that data visualization skill comes in, a, a skill that I am sorely lacking, right? developing um, task-specific data models and machine learning models. If you don't have a data model that makes sense, it is going to be very difficult for you to train machine learning models. Uh, using the wrong data structure can be a total nightmare, uh, especially if you're dealing with text data and you've turned it into JSON and then you need to return that JSON as a string and then your model chokes and dies on it and you can't figure it out for three weeks. Not that that happened to me like a month ago. Um, and then, of course, enhancing the ability of analysts to deal with at scale data, which I really do mean is taking the deluge of data that SOC analysts are faced with and turning it into something that they, as people who 
don't find using a Jupyter notebook exciting, people who don't want to train models, just people who want to find evil and get rid of it, um, <clears throat> turning that data into something that they can cope with, right? So a key line that was missing from the earlier chart is that understanding of security processes, right? And it's really important for analysts, data scientists, if you're going to use that term, for ML engineers to understand those security processes. That way you don't write a classifier that depends on the system language and the compiler, right? So how do we, how do we think about understanding security processes for data scientists, right? For people who are coming from, you know, a physics PhD into working in a security organization. Um, I don't want to imply that you need to be an expert, right? You don't need to be a super competent reverse engineer to know how to write a malware classifier, right? It helps, but you don't have to be. What's important is that you can work with those subject matter experts and you have enough of a background to understand what matters to them and how they do their jobs, right? If you spend a day with a malware analyst, you're going to very quickly learn what matters. They're going to say, oh, it's making, you know, this API call, it's importing these libraries, we've got, you know, uh, packing in here, right? All of these things are hints that something might be malicious and you learn how to deal with them and reason about them together. And so when you get a classifier that does weird things, you can say, that's not right. And you don't have to wait until like two days before it goes to production and customers freak out. You can catch it early on in the process. Um, and you know, I've, I've mentioned this a couple of times at you know, various get togethers, at, at you know, meetups and uh, even to my own organization. And one point that I always get is, but security data scientists, data scientists, they're all so busy. And like, so what? Like, excuses. Um, I, I think that that's an excuse, right? We are busy, but this matters. It's important. It's important that you have the appropriate skills and that you invest in the right parts of your skill tree to do the job that you're assigned. So what is the job that you're assigned and how does it matter? How do you structure your team, right? And it's important when you're building your party, when you're building your security data science team, that you collect the different skills, you collect the different strengths and weaknesses so that you can support whatever your organizational mission is, right? So I'll give a lightly fictionalized real world example of my party, right, my, my team. And so we have me, right? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a, a mini max rogue. I've, I've invested a lot in my decks and charisma, right? I've got very high security skill, high machine learning skill. Uh, but I am, I cannot write Terraform. Gun to my head, I could not write Terraform. It, I love everybody who does. My brain doesn't process Terraform. It doesn't make sense. I can't do it. I've tried. Golang and Terraform. Those are the two I can't do. Um, if you love Golang, I, I actually don't apologize. Um, data visualization, is just not a place I've spent a lot of time. I can build like some basic charts. Like if I can do it with like plt.plot, I'm a filthy Python user. Um, I'm sure there's somebody in here who loves R. I'm sure Gabe is listening somewhere and to him and to Bob Rudis, I apologize. Um, I, I do know that ggplot is better. I'm just never gonna learn how to use it. Um, so I, I'm very, very poorly skilled in data visualization. And so, when I'm trying to build out my party, I want to bring on Jamie, who's, who's our tank, right? And by the way, I do have the permission of these people to show their faces. It's not just, th these are real people. Um, so Jamie comes from like a, a real dev background. She's wonderful, she's brilliant. You know, kind of familiar with security, but, but newish to it. Uh, but she's, you know, competent at data processing, ML, data visualization, competent, more competent than me. But she brings up all of the infrastructure and ops, stuff that I can't do. If, if it involves a .tf file, if it involves a .vars file, I go, Jamie, can you please help me? Like, I need you for this. I can't do it. Somebody said ECR to me. That's gibberish. That's nonsense. EKS, never heard of her. Don't know her. 
we're not friends, right? AWS doesn't make sense to me, uh, but it makes sense to Jamie. And so I am happy to, you know, do my, my backstabs and whatever, and she is happy to tank the, uh, the AWS damage for me. And then, you know, we've got another member of our party, Robbie. And Robbie is just a, a wonderful, like, druid, kind of mid-range, like, 15s on every stat, you know? He's, like, he's fine. He's good at everything. Um, not not min-maxed. He's got no dump stats. He's really built a balanced character. And he's wonderful. He's really, really good. Um, and so we have this party with these, these complementary skills, right? We've got me working on the deep security stuff and being able to mentor them on the security side of things. I have a lot of background and, and deep knowledge in the machine learning side of things and the large language models side of things. Uh, so I can, you know, cover for them there. Jamie is happy to bring up all of our infrastructure and manage it for us. And then Robbie is kind of just an all rounder, whatever you need, but there's something missing. Uh, we don't have any casters, right? So my party, uh, even though I have tried to build it very carefully, doesn't have anybody who's really, really, really good at data visualization. And for what we're doing now, that's okay because we're mostly supporting these internal operations uh, SOC people, right? But if somebody asks us, hey, can you write an executive report and, and put it out to the world? I say, no, no, I can't. I don't know how to do that. Uh, I'm going to build you really ugly charts, and I'm going to have to go to our BI team and, and say, like, hey, can you help? Because you all build beautiful charts all day, and I don't know how to do that. So it's really important to build that balanced, you know, security data science org, and it's really important to have a deep well of security knowledge to pull from, especially when you have data scientists who are coming in from this non-security background, right? And so with that, I kept this incredibly short. Um, I, I am all set and happy to release you all to ask me questions uh, and then to go eat dinner. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Eric. Wonderful talk. Uh, really interesting. If you have any questions, you can use this mic uh, and ask Eric your question. Thank you. I've, I've asked a question at everything, everything that's gone on in this room. Um, I'm curious to know how you deal with LLMs, because they seem to be so just, uh, who knows what's going on under the hood? You know, when I push, you know, regenerate, regenerate, I get all this stuff back. There's all these ways you can sneak in. The previous uh, presenter talked about how you can reposition something. Because I deal in AI governance, and I'm trying mm -hmm. to get my own head around that. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, I, I love, no, I, I really do. This is something I've spent a lot of time on. And so I'll tell you a little bit about how I've dealt with it as we're prototyping some, some stuff, right? Uh, which is that, when I'm building it, it really depends on the audience, right? Who's my consumer? So I've trained some language models to work with our SOC analysts to support them, right? And one of the things that SOC analysts do other than try to break my system, no thank you, John, uh, is ask it questions about things like indicators of compromise, right? So these things where accuracy is incredibly important. Right? It really, really, really matters. Because an IP address that was benign yesterday might be malicious today. And the trouble is that with a large language model, even if you can guarantee that it memorizes all of its training data, which is its own governance problem, by the time you're done training a language model, 7 billion, 35 billion, 70 billion plus parameters, that data is going to be stale if it's about an indicator of compromise, a domain, an IP, you know, uh, it may not have seen a hash before, right? Are you gonna put every possible hash in there? No, of course not. So one of the things that I've done is built guardrails that ask it what kind of question you're asking. And in my case, for our SOC analysts, if it's about an indicator of compromise or if it's about a vulnerability, I don't even have it talk to the language model. 
I have a guardrail, uh, and NVIDIA has built some wonderful guardrails on Nemo. There's, you know, a lot of ways to do these guardrails, but if you're asking it about an indicator of compromise or a vulnerability, a particular CVE ID, what I do is I say, don't talk to the language model. Short circuit, go query a structured data source, right? Go query all of our telemetry, pull it back, right? There's a separate system for doing that. And then return that structured data that tells you this IP address is a Cobalt Strike Command and Control domain, a Co Cobalt Strike Command and Control IP, right? It's a known malicious IP. Then you take that, return that, and have the language model return something that's readable to an analyst, right? And it says, like, IP, you know, 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 .8, probably not that one, is malicious. It's a Cobalt Strike Command and Control IP. It was last seen on such and such a date. Uh, and then the analyst goes, oh no. Um, we have to do something about that. And then they can ask a follow-up question and be like, okay, well, how do I remediate a cobalt strike, you know, infection? That is not going to get sent to a structured data source. That is going to go to the language model that's been fine-tuned on all of this security data, all of these reports and whatnot. And then it's going to say, oh, well, you, you know, reset credentials, quarantine the machine, re you know, restore from an own good image, you know, whatever, right? Uh, all of that advice that it kind of gets trained on. And so we pair the language model with trusted structured data sources to retrieve that relevant information. And that kind of helps us ensure that in cases where accuracy is really, really, really important, we circumvent issues around hallucination, uh, which Man, what good branding from from language model providers, right? It's 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 making shit up. It's making things up. Um, yeah, so that that's how I have dealt with it. Um, there are certainly other ways to do it. Having like a uh, chaperone language model is another idea that I've seen, where you have a language model read the conversation between the user and the language model and say like, is this going okay? Does it look like the user's trying to do bad things to this language model? Does it look like this language model is saying things it probably shouldn't say? And then what that chaperone can do is, you know, short circuit the conversation and kind of push the language model back in to be like, oh, I actually can't answer that question. I don't know the answer to that. I am a helpful, harmless language model. I cannot tell you how to build a bomb, right? Um, so those are the two models, for want of a better term, that I have seen work. Um, I'm sure there are others. It is an emerging field. But I think that those are some really strong ways to to do that, right? And again, with the, the security data science point that I want to drive home is, if you've never worked in security, you may not realize that shoving a bunch of indicators of compromise into your model is not actually helping anybody uh, and may actually be confusing. You need those guardrails in place because whatever the WannaCry domain is, uh, not not malicious anymore, probably. It's probably sinkhold, right? That's sinkhold. I don't know. Somebody ask Marcus. He'll know. Absolutely. Go for it. Hey, uh, could you go back to the slide where you have the roles and the check marks? Cool. So uh, I have a couple questions about this. Um, I guess the first one is um, you have these kind of broken out as separate things, and you could read this chart as sort of a progression of skill from left to right, but I'm not sure that's quite accurate. Uh, could you just maybe give some thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think it's it's organized from left to right just so that I could fit it all on one chart. Um, but it's it's definitely not a progression, right? MLOps is, I mean, I would be lost without MLOps, and I would be lost without data engineering, right? Like, I cannot build ETL pipelines on the far left side of that and I cannot deploy and manage my own infrastructure on the far right side of that. I'm very comfy in the middle part. And you could reshuffle these roles, you know, these responsibilities however you want. This was just 
more aesthetically pleasing to me. Um, I do think that the one place where there is kind of a progression, and again, it's one of the, the issues I take with the term data scientist, is I do think that data analyst is sort of a precursor to the data scientist, where it's as you develop these more sophisticated modeling skills, you become, you know, a data scientist. That said, as I mentioned, like the, the business intelligence team, I am not very competent at data visualization. They are data analysts who are amazing at it, right? So I kind of see the data scientist as somebody who's dealing with the at scale, progressive, overall, uh, you know, large scale data and pulling insights out of it in a programmatic way. Whereas a data analyst is more like, run this one SQL query, dig in super deep on that and pull out the individual actionable insights. Um, I think that a lot of people would take umbrage with that. I think I might even take umbrage with it, but that's kind of how I'm envisioning it for the purposes of this chart and literally nothing beyond it. Uh, so that's kind of how I see it is, is this isn't really a progression, right? Like an ML engineer is not necessarily above and beyond a data scientist. It's just that they are more focused in on the machine learning care and feeding and deployment and, and all of that, where a data scientist may need a broader set of skills to be able to clean the data, collect the data, explore the data and understand it, right? They need some of those analytic skills where an ML engineer can get away with not necessarily understanding the particulars of the data uh, and how it is stored, structured, and cleaned. They need to understand what the implications of it are. They need to understand, like, what is this data? What does it mean? How should this look if a person does this, right? Like, if you were doing it manually as opposed to automating it, what does a relevant input look like and a relevant output look like? Uh, but they don't necessarily need to be concerned with how do I extract the individual features from this data, right? I think that this maybe is more of a progression of the data from data ingestion to model lifecycle management. I think that that may be the progression that, that is captured here, right, is that the data engineer needs to bring in the data, store it, ETL it, uh, extract transform load for those who don't know what ETL means, um, right, make it live in the database, make the database happy. I'm sure there are other things data engineers do. I am not a data engineer, so apologies to every data engineer listening. I'm sure you do more than that right? The analyst kind of pokes and prods at it. The data scientist figures out how we want to model it. The ML engineer helps build, test, and train that model. And then the ML ops engineer will go ahead and make sure that that model is deployed, scalable, and productionized. So I think that that's maybe the progression that's envisioned here. Cool. Yeah. Uh, that kind of leads into my second question, actually, uh, which is just sort of uh, looking at this in terms of, uh, you know, sort of the development life cycle from exploration to model development to model deployment to ongoing maintenance. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how each of these roles fits into that cycle. Definitely. So. The first pass through, right, because it is a cycle, that initial model, you know, data collection, tr training the model, uh, testing the model, deploying the model, really gives us this from like left to right, top to bottom. Um, but of course, models are not trained once and then it's perfect forever. You have things like concept drift and model drift where maybe the data that you trained it on, you know, if you trained a, a model for malware detection uh, on data that was collected from like 1999 to 2008, it would probably not do very well on modern samples, right? Uh, these things evolve. Similarly with network traffic, right? I mean, the network traffic that I remember from 
the halcyon days of 2014 when I was tracking exploit kits to what modern networks look like now, oh my God, um, there is so there are so many outbound connections now to things that I didn't, but why, you know? So all of that is to say, at some point you're going to need to say, hey, this model is no longer as good as it was. And that's where ML ops, right? In that automating the pipelines and deploying the models sees, okay, the model tests are not hitting on the, the current data set and kick it back to the data scientist to say, do we need to reevaluate the features that we're using? Do we need to reevaluate, you know, the data sources that we're using? If you have to reevaluate the data sources that you're using, if you aren't collecting the right features, you may even have to kick it all the way back to the data engineer and say, hey, we need to pull more stuff in, right? We need to pull in something different. We need to pull in contextual information. We need to add to that. And then that goes back through that same cycle again, from top to bottom, left to right, which is, okay, now we have the data that we believe we need, we pull out the features, we create the model, we test the model, we evaluate the model, we say this one's good enough, and then you kick it into deployment, you build the tests, and then you, you know, uh, have that, you know, continuous integration, continuous deployment, and make sure that it runs and scales appropriately. And then inevitably, three months from now, somebody's going to go, Eric, your thing is not working anymore. And I'm going to say, I know. Uh, and then they're going to come back to me and I'm going to have to revisit that life cycle, right? So it is definitely, uh, I think, a, a key and maybe underappreciated part of ML lifecycle management is the run model tests. Uh, testing your models is very important. Uh, and, and I don't think that we do enough of it, and I don't think that we think enough about it as a community. Uh, but, you know, testing those models on known good data uh, or data that you know what the results should be. And then also the newest crop of data and saying, okay, does this perform in a comparable way? Um, and then monitoring that over time to say, is it just that like last week was just a rough week for the model. It, it got a lot, like a lot of bad news and it just wasn't happy. Uh, or is it that it is degrading because there is some change in the way that whatever we're monitoring, uh, whatever we're evaluating for is constructed and, and is working, right? Um, yeah. Does that? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Hi. Um, so as an experienced security practitioner um, who has aspirations towards data science, I'm finding that a lot of the materials that I can find are mostly about how to use specific tools, about how to you know, use specific programs. I'm wondering if you have any recommendations or advice about how to get a more th fundamental theoretical grounding in the topic? Yeah. Uh, I, thank you for that question. I actually love that question. So. If you're a security practitioner looking to get into the data side of things, I think that there is some value to certain specific tools, right? Knowing how, it, again, this is very Python biased, apologies to anybody who uses R or some other language that, that they prefer, um, right? Knowing how to use pandas, like I still have to Google the documentation all the time, and I've been doing this for a minute. Uh, you know, knowing how those data frames work, how you load data, what the data structure should look like, all of that is incredibly important. But when it comes to the theoretical foundations, I find that revisiting good old fashioned statistics and probability, uh, knowing probability theory, you don't necessarily have to go to like measure theoretic probability, uh, although you can if you're like hardcore. Um, or if you're a huge loser nerd who loves math. Uh, either way, uh, getting into that like deep probability theory is super helpful because a lot of these models are fundamentally uh, probabilistic, right? There are good old fashioned AI models like logic programming, inductive logic programming, one of my favorite things in the entire world. Uh, love it so much that no probability. Other stuff, all probability. So being able to understand, you know, uh, birth, death, 
uh, models and uh, Markov chains and, and those sorts of things, right, become really important. I think that if you can work your way through like a Casella and Berger uh, or, you know, thinking about like, gosh, oh, there's a really good book on probability theory that I can't remember the name of that I want to recommend and uh, I'm blanking. But things like stochastic processes are are incredibly important to understand, right? If you understand Markov processes and Bernoulli processes and uh, Poisson processes, you can usually get to the point where as you're looking at this data and contextualizing the data and thinking about it from a security perspective, if you're armed with that knowledge, you can go, oh, this is a Bernoulli process. Like, yeah, it's going to emit an event at some random interval, and I'm either going to get a zero or a one at any given time step, and I can just model it that way. And then you say, okay, well, how do I turn that model into something that's usable, that lets me be predictive? And then you can start thinking about your regressions or decision trees or whatever. Um, the other thing that I think is really important to think about, and shout out to my cryptography friends on this one, is also information theory, right? So when you look at your data and try to figure out, well, is my data actually telling me anything? Is this just noise or does it contain information? Understanding how information theory quantifies information will give you a good underpinning because the way that a lot of these machine learning models work is by reducing entropy, right? You're trying to reduce the cross entropy, the entropy between your predictions and the true values. And so if you grasp what the entropy is and how it's doing that, you can start to say, okay, well, the reason that my model is just like crazy and doesn't make sense is that the data I'm feeding into it doesn't actually contain enough information for it to develop good predictions, which is something I found out when I was writing my master's thesis on some network traffic and it was terrible. Um, but you know, such, such is life. So I think, yeah, th those are my recommendations is, is statistics, just good old fashioned, like Casella and Berger, um, stochastic processes and, and information theory give you a good theoretical foundation for understanding it. And then really getting some hands-on experience with the tools, even if it's like just building toys, um, knowing how to manipulate data in something like pandas, uh, or whatever data frame thing R has, uh, and knowing how to just do like basic scikit-learn models, that'll get you pretty far. Um, as exciting as large language models are, and as exciting as neural networks are, uh, one fun secret in security that makes me feel certain ways about people who I won't name, uh, is that most of our data is tabular data, and decision trees actually work way better on tabular data than neural networks do. And so when you start talking about large language models with security people, uh, some of them are like, this is the best thing ever. And some of them, like, our eyes roll back in our heads and we're like, yeah, but like, what is it actually doing? We're not dealing with language. We're dealing with, you know, logs and, and timestamps and network traffic. That's, that's tabular data. That's not text data. Uh, and so just understanding how we as security analysts think about these things uh, is a huge boon. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, we always talk uh, a lot about ML models, but uh, what do you think could be other outputs of a security data science team? Like yeah. you are talking how you feel your team lack a little bit of yeah. data visualization skills. So maybe if you had this, this skill, you could maybe be producing dashboards or maybe data 100%. sets, data products that could uh, facilitate investigation or risk management for other teams. So 100%. Uh, what do you think uh, about this kind of other outputs? Yeah, th no, these are, that's a, I love that question. Thank you for it. Um, these other outputs are actually really, really important. And I would like to shout out my colleagues at Gray Noise in particular. Um, 
Bob Rudis, if you're watching, hello, I love you. Um, where one of the things that they do incredibly well is they have these really good data visualizations that show you what the trends are, how things are scaling, what kind of you know information and inference they're doing. And these outputs are actually incredibly valuable, right? So I'm biased toward the modeling side of things because that's where my expertise is. But you look at some of the reports that are put out by you know wonderful organizations, Rapid7 included, um, and then the dashboards and and you know things put out by organizations like Gray Noise Labs that do a phenomenal job of really capturing, well, what are the vulnerabilities that are being exploited in the wild right now? Right? You can watch the trend lines go up and down, and that's incredibly valuable information for practitioners to say, okay, well. I'm not really concerned about this vulnerability because nobody really seems to be exploiting it, but this one is on an upward trajectory, even though it's been available for a while, right? Now, you can dig into that from a research standpoint and say, okay, well, what is precipitating more exploitation of this vulnerability? Maybe somebody just dropped a Metasploit module and so everyone and their mother can now exploit it for, for little to no effort. Great, but also, seeing, okay, well, this thing had no exploitation and now it's starting to go up, you can say, all right, well, it's a priority for me now to see if we're exposed to that, right? So that data visualization component and these other outputs, these reports, these you know, dashboards and those sorts of things are actually incredibly important for risk management and risk reduction. Um, and I, I don't want to undersell that. So. Yeah, definitely incredibly valuable. Hi. Uh, love your background because you have both, like this kind of data science and security. But I'm sure that most of us is not the case. In my, uh, in my case, inside my company is like our different teams, separate teams. One team takes care of all the data science things, all the processing, visualization, and other my team just take care of the security. Mm. So <laughs> I have like this kind of uh, start collaboration starting going on with them. So I'm not sure of from your point of view when you are starting to to work with other data science teams, what kind of security considerations we should have to other data processing teams that doesn't have this security uh, background. Yeah, definitely. I think what's important is if you are the, so if you have these disjoint security data science teams, right? Being able to, as the security person, communicate what matters and what you need to see, right? The way that data scientists in general work um, is what is what is my input and what is my output, right? And they'll happily fill in the middle. It's not too dissimilar from a machine learning model, right? Is you tell me what inputs you think about and you care about, you tell me what the output you need is, and most of the time they can fill in the blanks. Uh, and I, I think that that's what's really important, is being very, very clear about, you know, if I give you an executable, I want red or green, it's good or bad, right? If I give you, you know, uh, a bunch of logs, I want you to output the logs that might be worth looking at, right? What are the interesting, what are the anomalous, what are the weird logs? Because a lot of times uh, data science folks can understand that problem from a data science lens where you say, I have all these logs, I wanna know which ones matter. You know, a, a good data science team will then ask you, well, how do you figure out what matters? Because one of the things they can do is they can cluster the logs and they can say, okay, well, you know, if it doesn't fit neatly into a cluster, if it's not close enough to a centroid or whatever, then show it to somebody because it's, it's out of the normal, it's weird. Um, but if you say, well, these are the attributes that we typically care about, then they can say, okay, well, maybe we don't cluster all the logs, maybe we parse them out and then only worry about, you know, what are the uh, command line arguments, right? Like, I don't care if you're invoking PowerShell, I care if you're invoking PowerShell, please, yeah, I, I do. But like, maybe I, I pretend I don't care, I don't care what you're doing on PowerShell, but I do care about those arguments. Those are the things I really care about. Okay, great, well, now we can 
featureize on those arguments. So being really clear about what your inputs are and what outputs you're looking for, I think that fosters really good collaboration. And you can start to give them a sense of, you know, what matters to you as a security practitioner. And as long as you have a, a competent and engaged data science team, you know, learning from them and having them tell you, well, this is how we thought about it, this is how we approached it, can give you a good iterative cycle to start with one project and then on the next one say, okay, well, let's try something a little different. And then you all will become more familiar with their jargon and vernacular, right? Because sometimes we're just not speaking the same language and they can become more familiar with your, you know, security jargon. And then that'll just give you better communication overall. I think that's, that's really, uh, you know, it, communication is the foundation of all good relationships. You're welcome. All right, wonderful. Thank you everybody for your time. This was awesome. I really appreciated those questions.